The problems facing New Zealand's primary sector have been mounting at a rapid pace. So I think it's time for open hearts and open minds. Welcome to Sarah's Country. Tonight on your Tuesday, thank you so much for choosing to join us. Now with information overload, overload that is, sometimes it's great to find a home that gives you Hopefully what you want when you want it and that's what we intend on doing on the matters that matter most to New Zealanders that just straight up love producing the finest food and fibre in the world. This is in harmony of course with the environment and to the betterment of their family, their local community and the wider economy. I'm your host Sarah Perriam and in alliance with the wonderful people at Farmers Weekly, we all get out of bed every day to deliver you with the latest stories that you need to be abreast of uh, what you need to know to be those important decisions in your everyday. Monday through Thursday from 7 o'clock, broadcast live across 15 different social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn and Instagram, as well as farmersweekly.co.nz and seraperium.com. And what I think we don't mention enough is that Sarah's Country is broadcast every weekend, Saturday and Sunday mornings, on local radio stations across this country. We play a best of... Now, I want to talk about this because local radio stations, our community frequencies with local radio hosts uh, and a majority sometimes broadcast on AM frequencies, uh, the national media and population sometimes forget about how vital these services uh, are like. Of course, Farmers Weekly turning up in your rural mailbox each Monday or sometimes Tuesday Um it's really important that we get information across to our most isolated communities across New Zealand, uh, local radio or, of course, in rural newspaper. We forget this because in 2020, this is still very much the case for a large proportion of our country. And I say large because we often forget that. I, I, I absolutely noticed this in 2018. It was a Will to Live launch at Hunterville Shimozel. It's an event that is run in the middle of the North Island. And a farmer based in Marlborough was out on a top peak of his Marlborough farm and he heard on the country on an AM frequency about the event and he used his landline to ring us to make sure that he could make the event on time. That's two years ago. Now, I'm talking about the importance of connectivity old school uh, for a reason to kick off the show. Even though I know you may be watching this live via the internet on a social media platform live or on demand on your smartphone, Bluetooth to your truck on a podcast, because I feel like we forget about the importance of our copper lines. And this is all to kick off because uh, you may not be aware that submissions closed to the Commerce Commission on Friday. Uh, and they wanted New Zealand's thoughts on the copper withdrawal code as chorus plan to roll up our copper lines across this country. Are we ready for this? Toan's Chief Executive Craig Young will explain to us after 17 how consumers must have access to an equivalent fibre service first. I know many of you are going, hang on, we don't even have cell phone coverage. What about calling an ambulance? I mean, this is a matter that matters a hell of a lot to the audience of Serious Country and, of course, something I want to follow very, very closely. Richard Rennie from Farmers Weekly will have more on this story on farmersweekly.co.nz uh, and hopefully on next week's paper. So tonight I know we have live viewers of all generations that watch Serious Country from around the country uh, and I want to uncover some great nostalgia on how we used to communicate with each other back in the day, whatever back in the day was for you. I mean, it's going to be a lot of fun because we have a 25-year-old, am I correct, Irishman? Yep, 25. I, 25, nailed it. When I was born, until I'd say maybe 10, we had a four-digit phone number on the old, you know, circular <laughs> dialer, uh huh, Joel. That's, Did you even? I mean, were you? Uh, you, you would have had an no. Alcatel by the time you were born. Yeah, I mean, I didn't get my first phone for a while, but whenever I did, it was just it was a brick, but I could walk around with it. You know, in the house, we we had like a wireless phone that we could walk around with. 
And that was a big deal, a wireless landline. Yeah. Oh yeah, the wireless landline that was that was pretty good. You could walk anywhere in the house on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> I used to fax my friends in the holidays. I have told this story before, early in Sarah's country. Uh, when we were in, uh, home from boarding school, to my dad's disgust at how many, well, he wasn't thinking about this, trees was, was being cut down. And what I didn't realise was later going to be called memes or releasing carbon. That was a thing, faxing each other in uh-huh. the school holidays. Uh, stupid little pictures. You know, I want to have a lot of fun with our audience tonight. Comment if you're watching or listening along live. How did you and your family used to get the news back in the day? And how did you used to connect on the copper? This will be a lot of fun, I know. Now, also, I know there's a lot of you that are underway with prelam sharing, which is an essential service for animal welfare, um, of course, to ensure ewes are not in full wool to tip up in muddy bogs and get stuck when they're pregnant. It's a very important part of the calendar so how are you getting on as shearers are reportedly facing potential backlogs in Hawke's Bay alone of 30,000 sheep needing shorn and this is due to that huge rain deluge uh, that they have uh, seen across the North Island uh, particularly in the, over the last weekend and week. It's also this dramatic skill shortage off the back of border restrictions to migrant sharers and has been a long decline in skills in the industry. I want to hear from you because I want to know uh, how it's looking at your place, sheep farmers. What is the feeling like of peeling off uh, priceless fibre? Some reporting is worth less than straw. We're going to be joined after 7.20 by New Zealand Sharing Contractors Association President Mark Barracliffe as almost $2 million was announced by Mr Jones uh, in government funding last week to develop sustainable integrated training for sharing and wool handling. Let's hope there's enough Kiwis that are ready to not just sit behind an office desk as the sector fears for what is looking like a long blow. The UK and European unions are wary of closing trade negotiations with New Zealand because we're ahead of an election approaching. I thought we were sitting in the hot seat, apparently, to get this closed ASAP as the UK were desperate post-Brexit. Uh, we'll find out more from UK-based Kiwi uh, Jeff Grant, who is our Red Meat Sector representative over there. He's going to give us an update after 730 And to close the show, and a bit of a theme this week, as we're going to work through the great environmental work done previously and planned into the future by our community river catchment groups. Anna Nelson from King Country River Care Group is going to join us after 7.40 to discuss the allocation of another $2 million that they received from the government last week towards an area that's going to cover over 183,000 hectares of farmlands, wetlands and river boundaries. But first up, why are you rolling up our copper chorus? All that with Telecommunications Association of New Zealand CEO Craig Young uh, fighting for the user first up on Sarah's Country. This is Sarah's Country. Balance has its own team of innovation specialists. It's our job to lead the way, working with some of the most cutting edge science and research. We've got partnerships with some of the best suppliers in the world, so our farmers get the very best products for New Zealand farms. And in every region across the country, the conditions are very different, and farmers and growers' needs are too. That's why we're always looking for solutions that are just right, like here at our Huntley Service Centre. And here in Canterbury, we've got a self-service silo, so I can pick up fit when it suits me. And here in Morrinsville, we've got a world-class mill. That means that we can safely deliver our customers with the freshest, highest quality feed and minerals. It's about putting the customer first because that's what drives our business. We've been focusing on faster turnaround of orders. We've got to get the right products to the right places at the right times. Here in Taranaki, we've got New Zealand's only urea manufacturing plant. It's where we create our premium sustained fertiliser. We're supplying nationwide and working locally. By getting to know you and what you want to achieve, we can help you get there. And with the new My Balance platform, Balance has put my farm at my fingertips. In fact, we offer support in all sorts of ways, sharing the best nutrition practice with farming families across the country. Whether we're talking about animal health, farm productivity, or looking after our natural environment, sustainability underpins everything we do. 
We use our local expertise and the latest tools to help farmers and growers navigate the changing regulations so you can leave your farm in great shape for the future. And we can be really accurate avoiding areas like wetlands and waterways with our award-winning Spread Smart Tech. It makes the job far safer, more efficient and gives you the best results. When you've got access to that kind of know-how, you've got the support you need to make sure you're farming sustainably. It's that kind of thinking that'll keep us going for generations to come. Together creating the best soil and feed on earth. Now I've been made aware of an, a website, it's called saveourlandline.co.nz. There's many millennials like myself who have often caught ourselves thinking, really who even has a landline anymore these days? I mean, even my father Bob, and we all know he's a technophobe when it comes to it, he doesn't even have a landline. But it is a real issue for so many parts of this beautiful country that still rely heavily on that piece of copper wire and of course uh, papers like Farmers Weekly that are delivered in physical form every week. It's their outside connection. Well, Chorus plan to roll up our copper. I was shocked when I heard this and, of course, straight away needed to go to a man that I know knows a lot about this and sticks up every day for the telecommunications users of New Zealand. Uh, that is CEO Craig Young and joins us now via, probably not copper, <laughs> I'm imagining Craig. <laughs> Kia ora, Sarah. What is going on? I mean, of course, obviously, we're talking about this because the mission is closed on Friday the 17th, and this was around the proposed protections on Chorus's uh, roll-up. But how did we lead to this? This isn't a, just an overnight decision. No, this is all around about the fibre that's been rolled out to around about 85% of New Zealand. So this is where um, they're putting in this new fibre to home. So, for example, I've got it here in my house, which is on... Uh, which is in Rodney and the North Shore of Auckland. Obviously, I'm in an urban area. So the the deal is once uh, Chorus have rolled out fibre to enough areas, they will be able to pull out their copper network, If uh, which is you know understandable in that they don't want to be running two networks at the same time. I liken it a lot to... Uh, you know, ripping up checkbooks as we force people to, of course, uh, go towards FPOST, et cetera. But we're still not pulling the coins and the notes off the shelf. And there is so many people that would love fibre. We, I spoke to Duncan Hum in uh, Mount Summers. He said, I can stare at the fibre box and I would pay for yeah. it to get connected, yeah. but they just won't pay attention and they've been banging on Chorus's door for three years. And then we've got people that are on copper because they're hidden behind a hill that they can't get satellite. I mean, some of these things are completely impractical. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think the first thing you need to think about is that uh, Chorus will not be allowed to pull the copper out where there is no fibre. So that 15% of New Zealand where they, there is no fibre, they have to continue to provide the copper service where it's being used. Um, there are other technologies that are being rolled out. So obviously there is increased mobile coverage and uh, there's also wireless broadband from the wireless ISPs. So those are often better choices than copper anyway. And you still have this thing you call the landline is really um, a lot of people still have landlines, but they're not necessarily on copper anyway. Um, what, you, what you're thinking about is the traditional copper landline, which most of us had, you know, years ago, and I had a five-digit phone number, by the way. <laughs> and um, the beauty of your good old copper landline is that if the power goes off in your house, that service keeps working mm. because it's copper and it can carry an electrical charge. All these new technologies, mobile, fibre, while you think you've got a landline, um, they, don't, they don't work when the power goes off. That's the biggest issue. I'm looking at the saveourlandlines.nz website and, of course, submissions closed on Friday. Uh, and, of course, they'll be wanting to understand the, the importance of uh, copper-based landline phone. This is the first I knew about it post yep. the submissions closing. Yep. That's a worry. 
<laughs> well, look, I think there's a couple of things to think about. First of all, the landline, there's two parts to it. The first is the bit that comes to your house, the physical bit that connects to your house. And there's multiple ways you can be connected these days. It might be wireless, it might be copper, it might be fiber. The second part, which was an announcement by Spark last week, is the actual technology that gives you the ability to talk over that piece of copper is also past date and has to be taken out. They cannot repair it anymore. They cannot find spares. And this has been coming for quite a while as well. So you've got this double whammy happening at the same time. I think where you've got to go with this is we've got to keep up with technology, but we've got to look after people as it changes. And so it, it is right. Chorus will need to keep the copper in, in uh, certainly in rural areas but there's other technologies coming that will be uh, needed to be in place. And it's really going to be around um, looking after those people that are vulnerable, that cannot make a triple one call when the power goes off or when the service goes down. Many of us like millennials, like yourself, have a mobile phone and I'm sure you've got it fully charged and you've got a battery, uh, you know exactly where you've got a power bank and you know how to keep it charged. It's not, you're not the worry. The worry is the person that's relying on that um, that old phone and doesn't have a cell phone or doesn't have it charged. So some of these new technologies that could come into rural New Zealand that you're seeing on the peripheral uh, into the future, what can you get us excited about, uh, Craig? Yeah, well, I think what, we, what we're seeing now is this second wave of of mobile technology being rolled out into rural New Zealand. And we're sort of doing it backwards, I think, now. Um, certainly we're getting 4G being rolled out through the the, the latest technology. Um, there's still a lot of 3G, and look, the Gs are just the, just the generation. So 3G is not that fast, and really during COVID showed us it's not really up to scratch, and we need to do something about that. 4G will do what we need it to do at the moment. And then we've got 5G coming. And there's all sorts of stories around about 5G. But one of the good things that 5G, I think, will do is will help in rural New Zealand where we can get faster speeds over mobile. And then with the wireless ISPs as well, you know, they're constantly upgrading their networks as well. So we will see more and more of this wireless technology. And that will mean that our landlines will disappear. Mm. And as you said, landlines, the concept will be the same, but it'll be voice over internet um, providers. What is something, you know, what are the sort of main things that you're pressing on as two ends, a telecommunications user association, to ensure that this is done correctly with the Commerce Commission uh, and that's, that the, the most vulnerable needs are taken into account? Oh, the biggest thing is going to be uh, twofold, I think. The first thing is making sure that the providers such as Chorus can't take a service away um, when there's nothing to replace it. There has to be an equivalent service at the same price, providing the same service and the same service levels. And the copper withdrawal code is a piece of work that we're obviously feeding into to make sure that's the way. This is all part of the changes made to the Telecommunications Act in 2018. And we ensured that there was a piece in there that said, you can't take away the service until there's something to replace it at the same time. The second thing is educating people. And so we're putting requirements on the, on the telcos and the providers to say, well, if you can take the copyright, because it's, it's not just a decision they can make. The commission makes a decision as to whether they can take the copyright in the first place. But if you can, then you must give people enough notice. Mm. People need at least six months to hear about it, work it out, and work out what the solutions are. And, and we know, whether you call them vulnerable or people who just... Um, uh, are not savvy around what the capabilities are, that we need to work with them and help them understand and work through the issues. Now, look, one of the biggest issues, then, and rural people know this, when the power goes off, you know, that's, that's really important that you can still do things like make phone calls. And so we're going to have to educate people around um, your deck phone. You talked about the wireless landline, the one you walk around with. Well, they don't work when the power goes off. Mm. So, you know, we've already got those issues. But we need to educate people, keep your cell phone charged, keep one on charge somewhere, have your phone system plugged into your generator. Um, those sorts of things are going to be important. Mm. Go on the, the old sat phone as well. Um, I remember mum saying you can't go on the wireless landline when that was uh, lightning. Was that correct? You get buzzed. 
No? Oh, no, the actual <laughs> wire one. I don't... The wire one. That's right. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was a piece of copper, and it's hanging in front. Yes. And in rural New Zealand, it's mainly hanging from poles. So yes. it's going to be a wireless, it's going to be a lightning conductor, right? So snap. It's like television. I don't know whether your parents used to say you've got to unplug the TV from mm. the wall when the when the lightning's going. I mean, most houses are earthed properly now, so you don't have to worry about it. That's true. Um, but, yeah, Craig, there's a lot of those stories around. While I've got you here, a lot of organisations yep. are putting forward their election manifestos. What is yours and what do you want to see uh, from our political parties um, uh, going into this election with rural yeah, sure. connectivity in particular? So we've got an event on the 3rd of September where we're actually getting together and we're going to get rural people with the providers to try and come up with, you know, what are the gaps that are left? And I think there are two things that I'm seeing and that what we're pushing, certainly when we're politics but first of all the people that can't get anything so those are where there's gaps in mobile coverage or gaps in wireless gaps in satellite or they just can't afford it or they don't have the device so you've got to you've got to put some money into that so that's what i'll be saying the first thing for the politicians the second thing is you cannot afford to leave rural behind so we've got this amazing fiber network in urban new zealand and we've got this patchwork in rural. We have to make sure that we're continually investing in rural New Zealand to make sure it's keeping up with urban because you can't afford to let any part of the country uh, go backwards. And we do have an issue at the moment with parts of rural New Zealand just not getting the quality service that they should get. Mm. You've got the right man on the job, rural New Zealand. I know Craig Young was involved in chorus and he was heavily involved in uh, rural and, of course, now fighting for you, Telecommunications User Association of New Zealand CEO, Craig Young. Thank you very much for what you do for rural New Zealand's connectivity. Loving the comments pouring in. I've got one here I can quickly read before we go to a break. Paul Harris has said, copper disappeared for us five years ago. They refused to maintain our copper lines. We have had families move out because of this. It was trying at the start, but as internet improved, it got easier. We have the main fibre line for the East Coast run by our gate, but they won't allow any connection. Poor connectivity limits our productivity. Absolutely right. And of course, we're going to discuss this throughout the show. I'd love to hear your situations around New Zealand now and what it was like back in the day, a bit of nostalgia about how you used to connect. I want to share with you, I've got this amazing book at home about the uh, history of the information age, information age, and it was how farmers in the US created the copper networks because the telephone company started by Alexander Bell thought that telephones would only be for the rich in New York. Farmers worked out, it's just a piece of copper wire and they set up their own networks. And that's what I love about our rural communities. Now, up next, we're going to talk to a great man in rural New Zealand, Mark Barracliffe, who is the president for New Zealand Sharing uh, Contractors Association about the struggles they're facing and skill shortages uh, as they head into a very, very busy sharing season. All that up next on Sarah's Country. This is Sarah's Country. People from all over New Zealand are doing their bit to help protect our waterways. Here's what Andrew Booth of Tituki is doing. We've got one existing wetland on our farm already and we're looking at developing another one. So that's going to be eliminating all the, the sediment, helping limit the E. coli flowing through, taking out the nitrogen, the phosphates. So it's, it's got a lot of positive spin-offs for the farm and the water and also just in, helps to enhance biodiversity on the farm. To see Andrew's full story, check out thevisionisclear.co.nz. Kiwi farmers wake up to produce higher quality food. Yet every night, some Kiwi families are going to sleep hungry. Meet the Need is a charity founded by farmers and it's here to change all that. We're about New Zealand farmers feeding New Zealand families by donating a small part of what we grow when we can. You can help us make sure no one in New Zealand goes to sleep hungry again. 
Visit meettheneed.org and follow us on social. I'm just seeing a comment, Michael. It would be great if we could see the comments I see. Um, I'm getting a, a selected view, Michael, so they're all spread across all of the different social media platforms. It is, of course, uh, broadcast across, and, yes, there's a few pouring in, so hopefully that answers that question. Now, almost $2 million will be spent developing an integrated training for sharing and wall handling, where skill shortages are dire, as COVID-19 border restrictions on essential workers are mounting pressure on this part of our sector. We are going to discuss shortly the challenges with New Zealand Sharing Contractor Association President Mark Barracliffe. Good evening, sir. How are you tonight? Not too bad, Sarah. Good. Coming, um, got it good. coming through Sorry. clear on the copper, I was just about to say. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. We've got uh, got some nice rain here, so nice and warm. Um, people can't be complaining around the king country anyway. That's good to hear, but apparently the rain is causing some strife with regards to a bit of a backlog, in particular in Hawke's Bay. Um, how are your sharing uh, members feeling about trying to get through this? And yeah, well, in the North Island, we're sort of just finishing off, really. But yeah, the, the Hawks Bay have been caught a bit, a bit of a late start, and uh, yeah, they needed rain. And hey, now they want to share some sheep, and guess what? They've got rain. So yeah, be careful what you wish for at times. But um, no, I'm sure they'll um, they'll get some fine spells at some point and, and get the job done, so that we can send our staff off down the South Island and help the, um, the pre-land down there. Yeah, sure, of course, and Hawke's Bay. When it rains, it pours in more ways than one. Now let's talk about the staff across the country and the skill shortage that we're facing. Can you give our viewers and our listeners a bit of an understanding about how COVID's dramatically affected uh, the sharing numbers, sharers and, of course, uh, wall handlers? Well... Funnily enough, um, we're actually in a, in a way better spot than we could have been. A couple of years ago, we had a, a fairly a substantial price increase and that um, brought a lot of staff back to New Zealand. And um, they happened to just either get stuck here or choose to stay here during COVID. So if they hadn't have been here, we would have been in, in really dire straits. But um, yeah, funnily enough, we're, we're slightly short, um, but not too bad really. So it's more... Um, we're getting the North Island to finish, and it's, it's a bit like this local tourism, you know, supporting our not going over the overseas for a, um, a holiday. You know, we're staying in New Zealand doing the work for the New Zealand farmers. So that that's awesome. Um, so as long as our guys go down south and girls go down to the South Island, help them out, I think will be not too bad for prelim. It's more the um, the November, December, January, February period, March. That, we're, that when we rely on heavily from overseas staff, UK and Australian shearers popping over to help us in our busy time is when it's really going to hit the fan for us. How many Kiwis were trapped at home that normally go overseas as well, sharing? Do you know? Yeah, I, I don't know that. Sorry, Sarah. Um, but I do know that I've got um, a, a lot more people that I know that I've shown with in Australia Um back here in New Zealand at the moment doing doing the mahi here. So, um, yeah, it's great to see them and um, I'm sure they're loving being stuck back in their own country. And you'll be very excited about the Provincial Growth Fund of $1.9 million going into some much-needed uh, training organisations. And these, um, could you explain around the, the micro-courses? Yeah, well, we lost wool um, training in the walls industry um four to five years ago. So we've only had limited training. Um, prior to that, we had the best training in the world. So we've actually got very good trainers. We just needed a vehicle to be able to put them to work, training our staff, and, and it's something they love. So um, yeah, getting this getting this um, this grant from the government is, um, for a pilot scheme is, is gonna be great because we, we've tried to fit un, in the under or into the rules given by government and seeing as we're such a transient nature um, 
our workforce, we didn't fit and things started falling apart. So we're, we're, we're going to prove that um, this this scheme, these two pilot schemes we got are, are going to give us exactly what we need, what our, what the employers need. And um, with the use of micro-credentials, which is basically smaller bites of training, so hence you can move around. You, you don't have to start training with one person and stay there the whole time and complete their training because their, their period of work doesn't go long enough. So um, hopefully it'll give a bit more flexibility. So we've still got a little bit of work to do, but um, you know the government's recognised the, um, the future in, in the wools industry and um, we're part of it by cutting it off. So um, yeah, big ups to them. Sharing Sports New Zealand has certainly suffered, and I know the Alexandra um, Fine Wall Show has been a casualty of this. Uh, it, it's very sad to see. What's the sort of uh, light at the end of the tunnel with regards to the sharing sports circuit? Yeah, well, I, I, I can't speak directly for sharing sports because they're a totally different identity, but we obviously work together, and um, being a passionate um, show sharer myself, it's it's our shop window. So, yeah, if we don't get people in from overseas, um, you know, they're a big portion of, of our shows when they travel around New Zealand. But not only that, a lot of the shows are a rural gathering, a get-together. Um, so you've got that whole community yarn going on. So you start dropping that out, it's, it's, it's a bigger, bigger thing than just shearers and um, wall handlers competing at a show. But, um, yeah, it's... There's many, many um, industries are going to suffer the same thing for the next 12 months or some more, I suppose. But as long as we all stay together and positive and um, maybe we miss a year but come work on coming back stronger next year. What about a bit of technology? We're all about the agri-tech space here at Serious Country and being innovative. Uh, young Otago's uh, Sid Strachan, six years old, sharing for a 10,000 strong online audience. That's a great shop window for sharing in New Zealand. Oh, awesome. Yeah, no, it's great to see those young fellas doing that. And, um, yeah, my, my kids are exactly the same. It's amazing what they pick up when they just sit there and watch you all day and, and you think they're not learning anything, but then they just start repeating that. And, and I bet you that boy's only six. And what you see, said he was sharing a teddy bear, did you? No. <laughs> what was he sharing? I can't remember. Um, yeah. But you, you put... Sorry. Yeah, you, you you set him a light on a on a lamb, I'd say, in a few years' time, and and he'll be away. Oh, I can tell you what. When I first shot my first first sheep at thirty three years old, um, the cockies in the wool shed was surprised as well. And I think you're right. You do spend that many years rousing, watching, um, that it does kick in eventually. Now, Mark, just to close, so you're feeling fairly confident for prelim down south, but of course it's uh, more the concern heading in towards the end of the year. Is there any messages you'd like to get out to farmers um, in preparation that could help? Yeah, just um, onto the farmers one, just more commu um, earlier communication if you can. Um, if you think you can come a little bit out of season in your own areas, that, that may help the, the peak workload for your contractor or contractors around that area. Obviously, everyone's a bit different. Um, some areas will be saying there's no shortage and some of the areas will be saying they're in um, dire straits and it just depends on the demographics of the age of their staff or, or whatever they've got going on. Um, I know at the moment, um, I think shearers aren't too bad in the South Island, but they're definitely looking for girls. So. You know, it's no good us cutting the wool off if we haven't got some, or um, well not girls, wool handlers, I should say, because um, girls and guys do both jobs in our, in our industry. Um, and, um, yeah, without them sorting the wool for the farmer, yeah, well, shearers haven't got a job. And actually, I'm just thinking back to an interview from yesterday. We spoke to Kate and uh, Dave Ackland at Mount Summer Station. Of Kate was, of course, part of that uh, wool working group report. And Dave Ackland is, is heavily involved in meat and wool for federated farmers. He was sending the message very clearly to our strong wool farmers of wanting to get a better price, start learning about shed preparation. What's your thoughts on that? Oh, definitely. Um the, the strong wool sector is in a bit of a cost-cutting mode at the moment and it's probably um, 
long term it's not the way to go. Um, but I think with this um, wool report that's been let out with um, Dame, Minister Damien O'Connor's um, group he put together will give us some direction and if, if we can pick up a few things off that and, and um, together truck onwards and upwards, um, you know, hence why we need this training. We need there to we need trained staff to be able to do the job properly at the first point we touch it because whatever we do, you can't undo what we don't do properly first. There you go. President for New Zealand Sharing uh, so Contractors Association, Mark Barracliffe, thank you, sir, for joining us tonight on Serious Country. Some great messages there around what is happening uh, in the wool sector uh, over winter and, of course, going into that some very important spring. Next up on Serious Country, we're going to head to the UK. Jeff Grant is our red meat sector representative, and I want to get a bit of a feeling for what is happening on the ground with these post-Brexit negotiations. Is New Zealand really got the UK uh, by the uh, long and curlies or are they just going, hang on a minute, let's just see what happens with your election. Let's get that from Jeff after the break. This is Sarah's Country. We're a large deer farm and very proud deer farmer at that. I grew up here as a little boy it is just an, an amazing lifestyle. I, I could never live in a city ever again. Just the big open spaces and just the peacefulness of it all. I think deer are very majestic, very intelligent animal. Having deer that are under pressure or anything like that or overstocked, you know, they really don't perform as well. You should really be spreading them out on beautiful pastures. Keeping them happy, a happy deer is a, is a good deer. And good feed, you know, good grass. We renew our pastures all the time in the paddock, so we're always getting the best quality grass. Well, I guess in the wild, though, they don't have the luxury of the grass that we put in front of them here as a farmed animal. I believe we've got some of the best English type deer in the country, if not the world to associate our brand with Silver Fern Farms brand is, um, works for us. Without the likes of Silver Fern Farms, then there's no point doing this, so they're very, very important for us. I'm Mark Tapley, very proud suppliers, venison to Silver Fern Farms. This is Sarah's Country. Currently based with us here at home in New Zealand, uh, came home pre-COVID lockdown, uh, is not based in the UK. This is, of course, on the story that Britain is scrambling for trade deals before it leaves the European Union at the end of the year. And really, does New Zealand get a sort of leverage over the UK as our talks continue? We're going to uh, discuss this further with Red Meat Sector Representative uh, here at home in New Zealand. And I'm sure he's happy to be here, Jeff Grant. Welcome to Sarah's Country tonight, Jeff. Hi, Sarah. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Now, uh, I'm sure that you've still continued to follow closely what is happening in the UK under that role as Red Meat Sector Representative. Where is it currently this week? Well, uh, the, the discussions for the free trade agreement with uh, Europe through the European Commission have had eight rounds of meetings and we're now at the crunch point. So uh, the agriculture offer is the issue in front of us uh, and is still not looking that bright. My assessment is that we will probably not see any movement until the end of the year. Uh, so we've entered into the first round of the free trade agreement with the UK. So we'll now have two in play. Uh, the UK uh, is likely to uh, not do anything also until at least the end of the year. So the, the, the key thing here is what happens with Brexit on the 31st of December. Uh, if there is a conclusion and they exit orderly and without a no deal position, 
uh, we will start to see those FTAs get into action in the new year. Okay, so uh, is it true that everybody's taking a little bit of a halt and a break because of us going into our election and knowing what they're dealing with uh, post the 19th of September? Look, I think the reality is New Zealand's always been <clears throat> up front and ready to go. Uh, the reluctance has tended to be from the European and the UK side. Uh, and on the basis of that, uh, while there'll be a pause in terms of the election period, the reality is uh, New Zealand's up ready to, to continue the negotiations. The difficulty we have got, so to give an example, for the New Zealand meat industry on beef, <clears throat> our current quota uh, effectively allows a European to have one beef steak in their lifetime. So if you eat one grass-fed beef steak tonight, uh, that's the last one you can have in your lifetime. That's how small the quota is. We're asking for a fair and equitable treatment of that. And the reality is on their side, they're getting a, a strong domestic push against us. And and so therefore, what do you believe would be a successful outcome for New Zealand's red meat sector? Uh, of course, uh, you were based in the UK, but of course, what's happening in uh, the EU as well? Look, Sarah, the, the, the reality will be um, unless New Zealand gets a reasonable offer in agriculture, and that includes dairy, horticulture, and also uh, the meat industry, I think we'll, we, we'll be forced to walk away from this. And so it's either an improvement or no, no deal, because the reality for New Zealand is that our increase in the North Asia market has given us a bit of flexibility. And unless we are getting an improved position, uh, I can't see why New Zealand would enter into a free trade agreement at all. Interesting position, especially with the New Zealand-China Business Council here in New Zealand this week with uh, the strong stance that each country is trying to take around things beyond trade. Uh, there's a lot of uh, murmurs about our over-reliance on China and how the UK and the EU deals are becoming of more importance. Look, I, feel, I think if you're looking out for the next 10 years, for the meat industry, these are mature markets. These are markets well-established. Uh, and on that basis, uh, we have good quota in terms of the sheep meat. But the reality is, unless you're getting an improvement, you might as well stick with what you've got. And uh, on that basis, uh, unless there was an improved deal around beef uh, with a substantial increase, I think that New Zealand would really struggle. And I think for the outcome where we talk about being ambitious and uh, forward thinking, both by the Europeans and the UK uh, governments, I think that they have to be true to their word and actually allow for that access to come. You've been based over there in the UK. We spoke to Stephen Jacoby last week, and of course uh, the Honourable Lockwood Smith is quoted in Farmers Weekly with Nigel Sterling's piece. Uh, now, tell me, I understand that we've got some, some seriously sharp Kiwi trade negotiators playing for the other team, Jeff. What's it like in that type of environment? Look, it, it, really interesting. In the two years I was based in London, the, the, the most interesting conversation you had with DEFRA, which is equivalent to MPI or the Department of International Trade, was do you know of any Australian or Kiwi negotiators that are interested in the job? Uh, and so there's, there's a high interest in both uh, New Zealand and Australia, the way we've operated over the last 25 to 30 years on trade deals. Remembering the UK individually has not negotiated a deal for 47 years. And so they don't have the school base. And, and so, yes, without any, you know, you, uh, Crawford Faulkner is a good example who's now heading the trade negotiations for uh, the UK with both Australia and, uh, and New Zealand. And that's just a reflection of how we're re recognised and acknowledged internationally. Mm. Jeff, you told me off here that uh, this is coming to an end of a role for yourself. Um, are you moving on, I mean, in terms of our representation up in the UK? Do you believe we need to sort of up what we're doing over there? So once, once you get into the actual free trade negotiations, a lot of the effort comes back into New Zealand for the industries because it's now a government-to-government 
uh, aspect. So what my role was, was firstly around Brexit, obviously, in an operational sense to make sure we could continue. And then the second aspect of that was the two FTAs. And most of that was about explaining New Zealand's position to the European Commission, uh, to Westminster, uh, to the consumer groups and the agriculture sector like the NFU. Once you get into that government to government negotiations, it's really our party now saying what we're prepared to accept or not accept uh, through the government agency MFAT. Uh, and look, you know, we, we've probably got one of the best negotiators in the world with uh, Vangelis on the New Zealand side. He well understands the European market and uh, he's a hard, hard nut. And I think he's the right sort of guy up against Hogan. Uh, and on that basis, it's really now a cat and mouse game uh, as we try and work through the agriculture chapter. Yeah, I know. Actually, we're lacking sport comment. <laughs> Maybe we could do, get a bit of trade negotiating um, on ESPN or here on Sky Sport. It's um, it's really proving to be something to follow very, very closely, Jeff, and something I'm sure was uh, a great thing to be a part of. Thank you very much for all of us uh, from the work that you did in the UK on our behalf in the red meat sector, um, and wish you all the best in your future endeavours. It's Jeff Grant. Bye-bye. Uh, of course, Thanks for the opportunity. thank you so much. Outgoing Red Meat Sector representative here at now, based at home. Now, next up to close on Serious Country. It's funny, we're sticking in the King Country. Last night we had two from Mount Summers, tonight two from the King Country. Anna Nelson, she's a coordinator behind the King Country River Care Group, which received uh, nearly $2 million last week uh, to provide funding uh, into a large catchment in the King Country to restore wetlands and uh, riparian planting. We're going to hear from her up next. This is Sarah's Country. Really pleased we got into this. Thanks for your help, Dave. It's a good idea, honey. Do you reckon it'll come out? Cover it in towel compared to leave it 10 minutes. You'll be fine. Good call, Dave. Good call on getting those security cameras, Dave. You call a new one yet? Yeah, kind of. When you've got decisions to make, we'll be there to help you make the right call. I'd go for those ones, Bob. Yeah, good call. Did you choose these? Oh, you know. For great advice and insurance, talk to FMG. The project aims to involve 150 farms in the Awakino River, uh, Mokau River and Upper Amanga Kiwa catchments covering more than 183 thousand hectares creating 43 jobs and of course uh, a further 20 trainees. Joining us now is coordinator for King Country River Care Group Anna Nelson. Good evening. Good evening Sarah. Now I'm sure this has uh, been a long process to sort of gather the herd around such a wide catchment of 183,000 hectares. Can you give us a bit of background to King Country River Care? Um, yeah, sure. So I guess King Country River Care has been going for a few years, um, but about two years ago, it's a group of farmers and they really said, look, we really we want to get um, to do a bit more and we want to make a difference. So they formed an incorporated society and they um, contracted me to, to do a wee bit of the work. They'd been doing it all as volunteers till then. Initially, it was in response to Plan Change 1 and some yeah, feeling that we our farming perhaps wasn't that well represented. So there was a kind of a regulatory threat, I suppose, initially. And then it really evolved quite fast to become around our community and the well-being of our community and the environment and the people in it. So that was, um, I guess, where we began a couple of years ago. And we've always been quite strong on, on doing the right thing on farm and how do we help farmers do that and help our communities. So kind of fell into a, we, we worked with MPI and got a project up and running around planning and were funded for that earlier this year, which really was getting for farm, farm environment plans and catchment plans and working together for, to, for the greater good for our community and our environment. And this one billion trees money was something that, I guess it works in really nicely with the planning planning project that we've already got underway. So we're looking to use this money to basically kickstart some of the um, action plans that those farm environment plans have identified. So that's sort of how we get the 150 farmers, people that have done a farm environment plan and are willing to take some first steps or take some more steps on their farms to do the right thing. 
and we're just looking to, to give them a hand with that and One Billion Trees has come on board so that's really exciting. What were some of the challenges in being able to motivate farmers who didn't feel that they had a problem but when it was a catchment um, challenge together? Um, I, I'm still working on that so there's definitely definitely farmers that are still um, not super motivated. Um, I think probably the key for me is, is getting grassroots farmers driving it. So it's not about anyone from outside coming in and telling anybody how to do it. It's about working locally. So farmers just, they understand their own local issues the best and working to find their local solutions and working with each other to, to learn. So what worked, what didn't work, they're usually more interested in what didn't work and um, just taking those learnings and, and spreading them uh, more widely. So. I think it's it's all about that grassroots um, ownership of it and, and taking ownership of the issues that we've got and um, yeah, working together. Pen Country River Care can help, you know, bring in a little bit of um, outside advice or um, try and try and direct things where needed or try and support farmers and communities where needed. But it, it's all about you, you know the communities, the, the people that are, are on the farm doing it, um, taking ownership and taking control. Yeah, and talking about that outside advice across uh, the industry, what sort of uh, workshops and support have you been able to gather together and what has been some of the most rewarding things for you as a coordinator as you've seen um, this momentum develop? Um, we're working quite closely with Beef and Lamb New Zealand. Um, so they, I did an RMPP facilitator training and Beef and Lamb have been quite supportive with um, facilitator training as well. And then we're doing farm environment planning or land and environment planning with them, the workshops through Beef and Lamb. So they'll be the key um, key industry group, I guess. But there's been um, a lot of su sort of support um, and encouragement from other groups as well. Um, rewarding for me, to be honest, it's a little bit more around the communities and just seeing farmers... Um, neighbours catch up with each other, meet each other, um, get over things that might have been an issue in the past and kind of look to work together. So I think, yeah, we've got heaps of challenges and heaps of work still to do, but, but that's what I enjoy. It's the people, the people side of it and just people that are, um, you know, actually enjoying dealing with something that's tough. This is really tough for all of us, um, but it's, trying to make it more easy, more doable, and yeah, just making connections is what I like about it. What makes your particular catchment of the Awakino and Mokau River catchments quite uniquely different? And do you believe that the government is now starting to understand that, that um, one size does not fit all? Yeah. Um, I think the government is starting to understand that, and I really hope that that's um, a message that we're all consistently saying. And um, I, I guess they, they do because they're giving us some money to spend wisely, as Minister O'Connor put it. Um, it's our issues um, probably around sediment and E. coli, which is not um, not uncommon across the country, but that's that those are probably what we've got to work with. And when you break that down into your smaller catchments, you can have a look at the different reasons why that's a problem. So it might be stream bank erosion somewhere or might be something else on a different uh, so we've broken our area up into eight sub catchments and that, that makes it a smaller group of people coming together and it's just looking, so I can't really give you a, an easy answer on that because it's actually much more localised than than, I, than even me. It's, I'm just, um, I kind of help, help those communities to help themselves a little bit and to talk about what they're identify their issues and learn about them. I'm looking at the key deliverables here from 2020 out to 2030. And uh, can I say politely, there's a hell of a lot of natives that you need. We've spoken on Serious Country in the past about it's all well and good throwing money, but we're short on a lot of seedlings and the skill set to be able to do so. How are you finding sourcing those so valuable native seedlings? Yeah, we, we um we're having so far so good. Um we've got a, a local farmer who's doing a nursery business as well, um, which he started for his own use but it's expanded. So and there is a few um a few uh, nurseries around us that are, are scaling up at the moment. So we we're um 
and we're always looking for opportunities to partner with others. So I think that there is um, quite a few people or groups of people looking at the opportunity of growing small plants. Funny, we, Mark Barracliffe, who you had on before, we're working with him to do some of the planting. So he's got some labour that doesn't isn't always busy when it's raining. And so we've got something going on there. So it's, um, yeah, there's some real potentials when you work with other people and just try and find the synergies, I suppose. So at the moment, it, yes, I agree. It sounds like a lot of plants, but it does look pretty pretty doable. Yeah. And talking about Matt, Mark Barracliffe, um, I've done some work with Sandra Campbell down in um, the South Otago catchments. Uh, a lot of the Instagram stories have got some of that unused dag wool plant, you know, for, for matting around these natives as well. And I shouldn't joke because it should uh, be worth more than that. But of course, great to see our natural fibre being used there. Um, I think it's just so important um, that we celebrate the fact that these catchment groups are something that are going to be so valuable into the future for our communities. What are some of the other things that you're really seeing um, key community issues are supporting rural communities by people coming together which was initially a smack over the back of the head with a stick but now can lead us into greatness oh yeah so there's plenty plenty going on um tonight there was a lot of uh, greenhouse gas um and emissions and how we um how we look to integrate that successfully into our businesses um i think there's a lot about confidence. So how do we attract and how do we make it a viable business and a community for young people? So we absolutely need to build the confidence um, in our, right across our communities. And so I think I, I love that catchment communities give a real chance for cross-sector, cross-industry approach. So, you know, we can, we can um, look for the strengths and the weaknesses across all of us, all the sectors that are in a, in a small community and and work on um, bringing out the best in that, I guess. There's there's going to be challenges without a doubt where we don't always find it so easy. But, yep, the greenhouse gas one, um, soils, understanding soils more, um, Indigenous biodiversity, so on the land and, and in our water, and, and looking at, at water, that water quality one, definitely there'll be plenty more to come with that. Oh, thank you so much, Anna Nelson. She's a coordinator there for the King Country River Care Group for all that you've done for your particular area. Um, and good luck for spending the $1.9 million wisely, as uh, Damien O'Connor said. I know you will, and well done to that particular area. So all we've got time for tonight on Serious Country. We're going to continue on this theme throughout the rest of the week, talking about the wonderful work that our farmers are doing around the country. And I'm really looking forward to Tomorrow night to a uh, spectacular limestone outcrop in Marlborough uh, that is set to be protected and a particular farmer, John Hickman, in the Marlborough area that is behind some, uh, some huge wetland planting, um, crying out for staff to support the Marlborough farmers that want to do some great work. So, of course, that will be on Serious Country tonight as well as a lot of great thought leaders as we do uh, every night from 7 o'clock live uh, in alliance with Farmers Weekly f- across social media platforms or of course on farmersweekly.co.nz and sarahperium.com If you'd like to get in touch uh, please email sarah at periummedia.com. I love getting your feedback and I'm receiving some fantastic uh, every single night suggestions for interviews so please send them through uh, and of course you've been a wee bit quiet in the comments tonight Fenton Wilson would like, I'd love to see, say to Jeff Grant that uh, he's pretty stoked to see he has a sheep fleece on his office chair of course Jeff is very passionate about the the sheep industry Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us uh, across wherever you are however you are connecting whether it be via copper I highly doubt it ADSL fiber 4G 3G probably not even 5G but uh, certainly um, connectivity is a very important part of not only watching and listening to Zero's Country uh, but of course uh, c- connecting around the matters that matter most to the communities across rural New Zealand uh, that matter the most to you. So I appreciate your time joining us whether it's on demand or live we'll be back again tomorrow night good night and go well.